Amen. I believe we mean our worship today. We believe it on the inside. Man, that's good. I believe that there's, there's somebody in the room today or somebody watching online that you've been fighting a battle that you ain't gonna win on your own. It's only won by surrendering it to the one that's already won that battle for you. And you may not even realize it today that that battle's already been won on your behalf. All you gotta do is you can have it back. Just give him the battle back. Just give it back to him. Stop fighting. Stop trying on your own. Just give it to him. Do we believe that today? Y'all take a seat. Y'all give it up for these guys for leading us in worship today. Woo! That's good. That's good. I'm so excited about what God has for us today. I'm just excited every time I'm given the opportunity to take a microphone, take a stage, or even if it's not on a stage, just the opportunity to go before God's people and just deliver the word that he has for them in that moment. And it's not something that I take lightly. It's not something that I just open up my Bible and pick a passage of scripture and say, okay, well, we're, we're gonna talk about this today. No, it's, it's a lot more than that. I, I, I dig back in my notes um, where God's spoken to me, things that he's preached over my life, things that he's spoken over my life. And um, that's, where, that's where these messages come from every time that I speak. I'm, I'm that way when I pick out set lists because that's what I do mostly around here is plan our worship times, pick out songs and um, worship uh, tunes that we can sing along with on Sunday morning. And, um, and people joke with me all the time because it takes me a long time to plan those set lists because I want to not just pick songs that we can sing, but songs that speak. Amen. Not, not just, hey, here's, here's my, my, my top tunes from Spotify this week. No, it's more than that. And I'll sit, and I'll sit, and there's sometimes where I maybe don't meet a deadline where I'm supposed to meet a deadline, but if I haven't got from God what he wants us to not just preach on a Sunday, but what he wants us to sing, then I'll just sit and I'll wait for him to tell me what it is. Because I don't want to just pick songs that we can sing, but songs that speak. I'm the same way when I plan messages and prepare, and so I'm so excited about what God has for us today. Are we ready? You ready? Because if we're not ready, we might as well go ahead and jump the line at Cracker Barrel. Um, but if you're with me, we'll do this thing. Actually, you don't get the option. We're going to do this anyway. So um, I hope you're ready. All right. Uh, John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Um, the Gospel of John. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you don't, you're in luck because we have a projector behind us that I pray is working. Um, and you can see um, the scripture that we're gonna walk through today. Super excited about this story. We're gonna jump right in here. John chapter nine, verses one through 11. Y'all ready? Let's read this thing. It says, as he went along, that's Jesus, by the way. That's Jesus we're talking about. Jesus is making his way. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now just put a, put a pin in that for a moment because I'm gonna ask you probably in about 10 minutes about that and you gotta have the answer, okay? So be ready. He saw a man that was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So Jesus comes across a blind man. He's begging on the side of the road. And what do his disciples do? They wanna know why. They wanna know why. You see, we don't always get to know the why. We don't always get to know the why. See, we're good at asking why questions. Well, why me? Why me? Why, why am I this way? Why do I struggle with this? Why do I find myself back here again? 
Why, why, why? Why did this happen to me? Why do I have this uh, disease? Why do I have this sickness? We, we're good at asking the question why, but we don't always get to know the why. And here's what I wanna propose for us today. As we go into this is stop asking why and start asking what. Stop, stop asking why am I having to walk through this and start asking what can God do through this? Stop asking why. Stop asking why. See, the devil wants to keep you asking why. Because if he can keep you asking why, he can keep you trapped in your past. But see, God doesn't want you to be trapped in your past. He wants to keep moving you forward, forward into a future, forward into your purpose, forward into the plan that he has for your life. He wants to keep you moving forward. And the devil wants to keep us trapped in the past. And in the past, it's misery. But God wants to move us into victory, amen? It's what we just sang about. God doesn't want you trapped in your past. He wants to keep you moving forward, forward. And so stop asking why and start asking God, what can you do through this? Let's keep reading verse three. Jesus replies to his disciples. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, the why didn't matter. The why didn't matter. He said, it doesn't matter. You know, it's not that his parents sinned or, you know, this man somehow sinned in the womb that he was cursed with being blind, but no, this happened so that, and this is the what, so that God's power could be displayed through him. So he's telling the disciples, stop asking why, that's, that's not important. What's important is what God can do through this, even though you might not understand why you're having to walk through it. And so that's what Jesus wanted to unpack for his disciples, and I believe that's what he wants to unpack for us today. Let's finish the passage. Verse four, Jesus keeps talking. He says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. It's me. The same guy you've seen sitting on the road begging, it's me. It's me. I am the man. Verse 10, how then were your eyes open? They asked. This is so good. He replied, The man they call Jesus, the man they call, he didn't even know who this man was. He didn't even know who Jesus was. So he said, this this man they call Jesus, this man, they, they, they know him, but I don't know him. This man they call Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could See, can we just give God praise for his word this morning? If you believe that he can still open blinded eyes, this isn't just a story for the past, but it's a story and a lesson for us today, amen? And if we don't believe that, again, we might as well not be here, but we're here and God has something he wants for each and every one of us. Today's message is this, messy miracles. Messy miracles. See, miracles sometimes are messy. They're not always clean. They're not always pretty. But see, God can work through the mess in order to bring a miracle. And that's what I believe he has for us today. Father, I pray that you take this word. I pray that you take these next few moments that we are gathered here together in your presence to hear from you. I pray that you take these words that you've given me I pray that you speak now. Pray that you be in my 
words that I speak. I pray that you be in my hands and in my feet, my whole body. God, I yield to you. Would you speak today like only you can? And we together as your church, we surrender our hearts to receive what you have for us today. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Tap the person sitting next to you and tell them, you're a mess. Now, if you just got tapped on the shoulder, look back at that, neck, that person that just tapped you on the shoulder and say, not as much as you. <laughs> not as much as you. Messy miracles. Messy miracles. All right. How many of you are familiar with the names Chip and Joanna Gaines? Oh, we got fans. They're not here, by the way. They're not going to come out from behind the screen. All right. So... We know, show of hands, show of hands. I want to see in the room. How many of you? Chip and Joanna Gaines. Not as many as I thought. All right, okay. So we got to do a little bit of background here for you. So Chip and Joanna Gaines, they are the stars of their own reality show. All right, two people know. All right, we're, we're losing people. All right, so Chip and Joanna Gaines, they have this show called Fixer Upper. All right, and it's a show where they take uh, homes um, that someone has purchased as is, they turn it over to Chip and Joanna and they come up with a plan and they renovate these homes. And Christina, my wife, she loves these shows and really any show like it because um, there's dozens of them now, you know. There's dozens of these shows and they all have their own little, you know, different things that they do, but they all follow the same script, right? They, they somehow acquire a house that's in rough condition they turn it over to whoever's going to do the remodel, do the reconstruction, whatever that it is that they're going to do. And then they do it, and then they unveil this house at the end. And sometimes people cry, and they get overly emotional about the house, when in reality, they're probably going to turn right around and sell the house to somebody else and, you know, take all the money. You know, I don't know that. Maybe that's just me making that up in my brain. But there's dozens of these shows. They all follow the same script. And I was watching one even the other day where... They had to take this house and they started demoing it. And if, you, if you're familiar with the show, right, and if you're familiar with Fixer Upper, this is Chip's favorite part, right? He gets so excited once they come up with a plan and they give him the green light to go. He says, it's demo day. It's demo day because they get to destroy things. And men like to do that, right? Take the sledgehammer, take the tools, start taking down the sheetrock, taking down the studs. It's demo day. And so when they do demo day, and this is the part that gives me anxiety because I don't like messes, all right? And so, but when they do demo day, they just make a crazy mess, right? They just destroy it all. They're ripping cabinets off the wall. They're busting into sheetrock. They're, you know, sometimes they're taking up the floor. It's demo day. But see, what's, what, what, what's important to realize is they have to make the mess in order to experience the makeover, they have to make a mess in order for the makeover to happen. And like I said, I was watching a show the other day and they, they started demo day and they started demoing and they kept running into problems, right? They, they kept running into problems so they had to demo a little bit more. They ran into more problems. They demoed a little bit more until the house really came all the way down to just a concrete slab. That's all that was left, just a concrete slab. And they built that sucker back and it was beautiful, it was functional, it was stronger. But they had to demo that thing all the way down to the slab. And sometimes the severity of the damage will dictate how much demo is needed. And it's the same way with us and God. Sometimes he will allow us to hit rock bottom so he can build us back to what he wants for us, to what he wants us to be, to the, the purpose he has for us, the destiny that he has for us. And that's where we find this man today in, the, in our passage. Said this, put verse one back up on the screen. It says, as he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. Now, there's nothing in this passage as you read it so alluding to the fact that this man knew Jesus was going to be coming along the path that day. There's nothing in there that says this man woke up and said, hey, this is the day. 
this is the day. I'm gonna get my, my best clothes on. I'm gonna get up, make sure I get my hair done just right. No, he woke up and probably did what he did every day, and that's survive. He woke up just to go through another day. It amazes me how blind people can get around their house. He probably got up, did his normal routine, counted his steps, got out of the house, got to his spot on the side of the road. And what he didn't realize is that this was the day. This was the day. And some of you, you know what I mean when I say that word surviving. You know that resonates with you. For some of you, that's you today. And you've tried everything you can do in your own power. You've tried everything you can do in your own strength to get that bank account back in the black. You've tried everything you can do to get from one doctor's appointment to another's doctor's appointment. You've tried everything you can do in your own power to overcome whatever it is that you're struggling with today. And you find yourself here today. You didn't, you didn't wake up this morning thinking, hey, this is the day. This is the day, but for some of you today, you walked into this room today just like you would do on any normal Sunday, or maybe you logged in online, you're, you're joining us on vacation, or maybe you're just at home today, or maybe you're clicking on this video six months from now on YouTube, and you had no idea you were gonna encounter Jesus today. But here's the beauty of the gospel, is you don't have to seek him out. He seeks you out. Amen? He seeks you out because he loves you, because he knows you, because he sees you, because he has a plan for your life, because he has a purpose for your life. Plans not to harm you, but to, to use you, to give you a future, to give you a hope. He's got a future for you. He's got a destiny for you. He's got a plan for you. And he doesn't wait for you to come along and find him. No, he comes along and he finds you. And I don't know who's sitting here today, but that's somebody's story today. That's somebody's story today. And I love this. This is the part that I told you to highlight a second ago. How long had the man been blind? He was born that way. He was born that way. And the interesting thing is about scripture, as I was kind of studying this and preparing for this, is that Jesus, he healed a lot of blind people. You know, scripture says, you know, that's what they were gonna look for whenever the Messiah was prophesied, was that he was gonna heal blinded eyes, and he healed a lot of blinded eyes. But this story is unique. This story is unlike all the others, because this is the only one that he healed where the man was blind from birth. Specifically says that. And now, I don't know if some of the other stories, those people were born blind or not, but for some reason, the author of this gospel, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, decided to include that little note in there for us, that this man was born blind. And I think that's important for us because I believe that's probably why this man didn't seek Jesus out. Because I'm sure he had heard news that, hey, there's this guy wandering around. He's healing people of blindness. He's, uh, he's touching people, healing lepers. He's healing people that couldn't walk. He's, you know, healing deaf ears. He's, he's healed blind people, but never has he healed anybody that was born this way. And so I'm sure this man thought, what's the point? What's the point? What, what can this man really do for me? He thought he was too far gone. He thought it was impossible for God. And how many of you have ever felt that way before? Too far gone. There's nothing that he can do for me. There's nothing that he wants from me. There's nothing that he could use for me. And here's the thing I want you to understand today is that just like this man, if that's you today, then you're positioned for a miracle. You're positioned for a miracle. Because if you feel like it's too hard for God, then you're in luck because our God specializes in hard things. If it's too hard for him, then you're in the right place because you're not gonna find it in any therapy, any counselor, any lover. It doesn't matter who you go to or what you run to. You're not gonna find the help you need. It's only in Jesus. And when you feel like it's impossible, he's the one you need to turn to. There's a story in the Old Testament, and you're probably familiar with this, of Abraham and Sarah. God had promised Abraham that he was gonna make him the father of many nations. And in order for that to happen, he needed to have a son. 
And Abraham and Sarah were so old when God told them this, that there's a story where Sarah actually laughs at God. How can this happen? Let's actually read it. Let's put it on the screen. Genesis 18, we'll go through this really fast. It says this in verse one, Genesis 18. Abraham and Sarah were very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out, my Lord is old. Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Look at this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. See, here's the thing. God had already given them this promise. Abraham and Sarah didn't believe it. So they tried to do it in their own power to the point where Sarah said, hey, this isn't working, Abraham. You know, so here's what we're gonna do. Maybe God wants us to do it this way. And so he, she gave Abraham over to her servant, Hagar, and they had a son. It's kind of twisted, right? And so, uh, you know, but hey, sometimes when you're up against a wall, you'll try to do things in your own power and just mess it up and make it worse. But God still worked through this situation. They had Ishmael, through uh, Sarah's maidservant, Hagar. And then God showed up and that's where the scripture comes in where he says, hey, I know I promised you, we're gonna do it my way. I'm gonna bless you with a son. And God waited till they were in the perfect position to experience a miracle. There was nothing that they could do on their own. Amen, because if you're 90 years old, I'm just here to tell you, and if you're 90 and you're in, in here today or you're watching online, it ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen without God, amen? And so God waited till they were perfectly positioned to experience a miracle because they were in a position where it couldn't be them, it could only be him. And so today, if you're sitting here and you're in an impossible situation, your back's against the wall, you've tried it in your own power and it hasn't worked, let me just say you're positioned for a miracle because God specializes in impossible things. There's another story in the New Testament. It's a few chapters over from where we are today. And this is probably Jesus's greatest miracle other than raising himself from the dead. It's the story of Jesus and Lazarus. And just real quick, look at this in John 11. It says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness, let me just back up really quick, give you a little bit of context. Jesus is with his disciples. A messenger shows up and says, hey, your, your pal Lazarus is sick close to death, not doing good. You might want to get over there. Mary and Martha are waiting on you. They really want you to come. They know that you can help in this situation. And so when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. And I love this in this, in this passage because Jesus loved Lazarus. They were close friends. He loved Mary. He loved Martha, but he still waited. He waited, not because he was trying to be mean, not because he had better things to do, not because he didn't want them to experience a miracle. No, he wanted them to experience a miracle and that's why he waited. He waited. He loved them so much that he waited until they were in the perfect position to see a miracle. We don't like to wait, right? We're not a culture that likes to wait on anything. We love microwaves, you know? We love fast internet, you know? Um, we do not like to wait. But as followers of Jesus, we have to learn how to wait well. We have to learn how to wait well, and I'm sure that this blind man in our story today wished Jesus would have showed up earlier, but he was there now, and Jesus was standing in front of him. Let's keep reading. This man's perfectly positioned for a miracle. John 9, verse 6 says this, After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them. 
Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means since. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, if you're here today and you don't find this unusual, there's something wrong with you. Because, because I don't have the best eyesight in the world. If I took this off, I could barely read that clock back there. And if you turn around, that's some big print on that, on that screen. I'm not blind, but I'm probably halfway there. And if I went to the eye doctor for my checkup, And I'm sitting there in the chair, you know, the crazy machine they put in front of your eyes. Those of you that have glasses, you know what I'm talking about. Put that machine in front of your eyes. And instead of helping me get glasses that help me see, if you were to turn around to the potted plant there in the room and he spits in the dirt and then he starts to make clay out of whatever happens there and then he proceeds to put it on my eyes, I can tell you this, I'm not staying. Because... I don't have the best insurance in the world, but I'm sure I could find a better doctor than that. And so just so you know, if you go to the eye doctor and they try to spit on your eyes or put dirt on your eyes, know that there's better health care out there for you. There's a better doctor for you, a better physician. But see, Jesus isn't your normal physician. He's the great physician. And if he tries to do something a different way, you better let him. If he wants to do something unique, you better let him. And it doesn't get much more unique than this. Jesus, like I said earlier, healed a lot of blind people. He healed a lot of blind people. And even the stories that you read in scripture, he does it different ways. One man, he just spit on his eyes. But if that's what it takes, let him do it. Jesus wants to spit on your eyes. You might not want me to spit on your eyes. Don't let anybody else spit on your eyes. But if Jesus wants to spit on your eyes, let him. Because he knows what's best for you. He knows what it's going to take to get you where you need to be. He knows what you need. And if he wants to use the messy method, let him. He wants to rub mud in your face, let him. See, because different conditions take a different cure. Your story is not my story. My story is not your story. And it's not the story of your mom. It's not your granddad's story. Every story is unique. Every condition is unique, so why shouldn't the process also be unique? And this was about as unique as it comes. But despite the fact that it was weird and odd and strange and probably a little bit uncomfortable, right? This man was obedient to the process. Despite the weirdness of the situation, despite what he was having to walk through, he was obedient to the process. And he allowed Jesus to put mud on his eyes, but that was just a part of the process, right? That was just a part of the process. After applying the mud to his eyes, what did Jesus tell the man? What did he tell him to do? Come on. He said, go and wash. He said, go and wash. See, in this story, Jesus took all of the initiative. Notice Notice when we read the scripture, never once does this man call out to Jesus. He didn't set an appointment with Jesus. No, he was just going through his normal routine, begging on the side of the road. And Jesus shows up. Jesus corrects the disciples. Jesus spits in the dirt. Jesus makes the mud. Jesus applies it to his eyes. Jesus told him to go and wash. And the man went. Never once does the man say anything. Doesn't ask for Jesus's help because like I said earlier, I don't think he really believed that Jesus could do this for him. But Jesus took all the initiative and that being said, Jesus needed to see an act of faith, a step of faith on the man's part. He needed him to go and wash. But here's the interesting thing. Jesus could have just given the directive. He could have corrected the disciples and then just turned his attention to the blind man and said, hey man, you wanna see? Go wash in the pool. But here's what I wanna ask us today. Would the man have gone? Would the man have listened to what Jesus said? And would he have gone and washed in the pool? See, Jesus knew that this was gonna take a process. And a part of that process meant that Jesus was going to spit in the dirt, make some mud, rub it on his face, and then said, go and wash. Jesus gave him a reason to go and wash. 
Because what's the very thing you're gonna do if somebody rubs mud in your face? You big disgrace. Never mind, we won't do that. No, if someone rubs mud in your face, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is say, well, hey, I gotta get this off. I gotta get this off. I need to get cleaned up. And so Jesus put him in a situation that would lead him to the pool to wash it off. And sometimes I believe that Jesus wants us to come to church. He wants us to read our Bible. He wants us to pray. He wants us to have a relationship with him. But sometimes he's got to rub a little mud in your face to bring you to the realization that you need to lean into what he has to say for you. And time after time, I hear testimonies of people and they, they get to church and, and they get back in God's word, not because everything's going really well, but because they've had some spiritual mud rubbed on their face. And God's have been merciful enough to get them to a position where they will get back into a relationship with God or they will enter into a relationship with God, but sometimes it takes some mud on your face. Sometimes it takes some mud on your face. And some might say, well, God's just being mean, like he's, like he's the kid on the playground with the magnifying glass that's trying to fry the ants. You know, sometimes people think that's God trying to do bad things to us. Well, why, why, why does God allow all these bad things to happen to me? Why is he doing all this? But see, God's more concerned with curing your condition than catering to your comfort. Somebody needed to hear that today. And it stings a little bit. And it doesn't make sense, maybe. But God's more interested in curing your condition than he is catering to how comfortable you are. God's more interested in curing your condition and he will do whatever it takes. Even if that means rubbing mud on your face, he will do whatever it takes to get you to a place where you turn your attention back to him. Whatever it takes to get you to surrender and follow him because he wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. He wants to move in your life. He wants to do something in your life. And sometimes it might require him to demo your life all the way down to the concrete slab. But if that's what it takes, let him do it. Let him do it. Let him do whatever it takes because that's What's gonna get you to the place that you need to be? And so praise God today. Praise God today if you're walking through a hard time. Praise him if you're walking through a trial. Praise him because he's moving, because he can use whatever it is that you're walking through to get you to where you need to be. And like I said earlier, he's got a purpose for your life. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a destiny for you to fulfill, and he will do whatever it takes to get you where you need to be. And so praise him today. Praise him today. Let him do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to get you in that pool. Because the pool is where they found healing. It was when he came out of that pool that he could see. But would the man have gone? That's the question that God posed me with when I read this. And so Jesus did what was necessary to get him to go to the pool. And just a little personal story in my life, before we moved down here to the south side of Atlanta, we lived on the north side and I went through a residency at a church up there preparing for full-time ministry. And when we were done with the 11 month program, we started searching and searching and searching and praying for God's will, his direction, the next step he had for us on our journey. And it seemed like the answer didn't come. And for over a year and a half, We lived in this family's basement. We lived in this family's basement and and little did we know that they were gonna become family to us. We keep in touch with them all the time and they were so kind and generous to us because they knew that God had a plan for us. Even at times when we questioned it, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you moving? Why isn't this working? And then a year and a half later, we stumbled across this church called Avalon Church. One summer, it was in July, and we came down and visited, and it was perfect connection. And so we went through the process. We're super excited about coming here. And then we got to September, and we visited, and um, all looked well. Super excited about coming. And uh, Pastor Richie won't mind me sharing this story because we look back on it now, and we know that God had a, had a higher purpose and a higher plan. But it was on a Thursday. I was sitting in a Walmart parking lot. I was going to buy an anniversary card for Christina. And I get a phone call, I waited all week. And as the week went along, I was like, this ain't looking so good. 
making me nervous, making me nervous. And I get a phone call from Pastor Richie, and he gives me the news that it wasn't a yes. And here's what he said, but it's not a no. Okay. So what? <laughs> and then like a few days later, I had a buddy of mine that was also looking for a job, and he said, hey, didn't you go down to Avalon Church, you know, and audition, didn't it go really well? And I said, yeah, I said, but that's all I was told. It wasn't a yes, but it wasn't a no either, and it's kind of weird. And, and he said, well, they reposted for the job. And I was like, thanks, man. Thanks, man. And uh, so we went for two more months, and then randomly, randomly, I ended up getting a phone call from Pastor Richie. But in those two months, God got a hold of me. And I, I don't know, you know, what all was going on here in that time, but God used that time to draw me close. I spent nights in his word, just reading through the Psalms, pressing in, getting to know God on a level that I've never known before. And let me just tell you, it's not so bad when God rubs mud in your face. And he takes a situation that's already not looking so hot, that's already not looking so good, and it just gets worse. Let him work through it. Let him move through it. Let him use that situation to turn you into the man, the woman, the father, the mother, the grandparent, the coworker, the boss that he wants you to be. Let him use that situation. Don't give up on it. Keep pressing into it. And really, this man in our story, he had a choice to make. He could stay positioned for a miracle, or he could experience a miracle. He could have sat right there and said, hey, man, stop. Stop. I don't want to hear it. I don't believe that you could do anything for me. But instead, he let Jesus put mud on his face. And then when he gave him the directive, he was obedient to the process, and he went and he washed and so for you today that are walking through a tough time, do you want to stay positioned for a miracle or do you want to experience a miracle? Do you want to stay positioned for a miracle or do you want to experience a miracle? Let's finish the story. We're going to make this really fast. Verse eight in John chapter nine, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begged, had seen him begging, they asked him, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg, some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am the man. Guys, it's, it's me. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go and wash. And so I went and washed and I could see. I love, I love the reaction of the people here because it's not like it was a week later or a month later that he came back from the pool. He went right there, washed it off, came back and he could see. And it's like they didn't even recognize him anymore. And when you have an encounter with Jesus, you'll look different. You'll talk different. You'll believe different. You'll be a better husband. You'll be a better wife. You'll be a better boss to the point that people might not even recognize you anymore. Because when you leave an encounter with Jesus, you're different. And God had a plan for this man's life. And it was simply this to be a testimony to those around him. And so lastly, this man was destined for purpose. He was positioned for a miracle. He was obedient to the process and he was destined for purpose. If not for this man's blindness, he would have never met Jesus that we know of, that we know of. It was because of his blindness that Jesus crossed paths with him healed his blindness, got him to see. And then also through that, his friends, his family, his community was transformed because of this man's story, because of this man's testimony. Go all the way back, put verse four back up on the screen. I know, I know it's probably not in sequence and they're probably gonna get on to me for this, but put, put John 9, four. You probably have to go all the way back to the beginning. Put it back on the screen. And it says this, this happened, Jesus said, this happened so that the works of God could be displayed. 
It was his purpose all along to display God's power, to display his ability. And when it comes down to it, all of us that are believers that have had Jesus come across our paths and heal us and give us new meaning, give us new life, we're all messy miracles. There's none of us that are clean. None of us that have done this for ourselves. We're all messy miracles. And we all have a purpose beyond anything that we could ask, that we could think, that we could imagine. God's got a purpose for your life and he wants to point others to him through you. He wants to use what you're walking through to point others to him. And so today, whatever it is that you're walking through, again, your story is not my story. Your story is not the person sitting next to you. Everybody's story is unique. Everybody's situation is unique. We all struggle with different things. We all battle different things, but God wants to use it no matter how bad it might seem to you, no matter how far you may seem gone. Nothing is impossible with God. He is the author. He is the finisher. He's writing your story and there's nothing in between. There's nothing from page one to the last page that's yet to be written. There's nothing that he can't use. For your good, but for his glory. There's nothing. There's nothing that he can't use. There's nobody that's too far gone. There's nothing that's impossible with God. Let's stand to our feet. Let's close our eyes. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I believe that the Holy Spirit's speaking to somebody today. I believe that God's here. There's no accidents here. There's no coincidences in the room. Just like that man begging on the street. God's got something better for you. God's got something better for you. And I believe he's speaking right now. And I just wanna pray a prayer over each person that's struggling with something that's walking through a season that doesn't make sense. And it seems like it's getting worse. Let me just say, it's okay. It's okay. God can still use it. God can still use it. Father, I surrender to you, these, your people here today. I surrender every story, every situation, whatever it is that people are walking through. I don't know what it is, but God, I believe that there's a lot of battles being fought in this room. There's a lot of battles being fought with those that are watching online. And God, I believe there are stories in this room. There are testimonies that haven't been written yet because of what we're walking through right now. But God, we believe that you can use it. And so today we surrender to you. We believe that we are positioned to see a miracle. So God, we wanna be obedient to the process so that you can fulfill your purpose for us so that we can be a reflection of your glory to those around us, to our friends, to our spouses, to our children, to our coworkers, to our community, God. We wanna be a reflection of your glory. And so may we surrender whatever it is that we're walking through. I surrender each person to you. Holy Spirit, would you speak in this moment? For those of you that are in the room and you don't know who Jesus is, maybe you are like that blind man that came, that Jesus showed up to that day. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't know who Jesus is. Step one for you is to enter a relationship with you. And he's standing here today and he's ready for you. He's ready for you. You had no no expectation that you were gonna show up today and that Jesus was gonna be here at 4200 Strong Rock Parkway, but he's here. And if you're here today and you're like, I would love to enter into a relationship with Jesus, you can pray a simple prayer like this, Heavenly Father, I come to you a sinner in need of a savior. I believe Jesus died so I could be forgiven and rose again so I could have life. Today, I receive that new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, can you just give testimony to the Lord? Anybody, 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 anybody. If you prayed that prayer online, you can click the button at the bottom of the screen. 
just to say that you received Christ. We would love to know about it. If you prayed that prayer here today, you can fill out the next step card. Pastor Richie's gonna walk through that in just a moment, but we're gonna sing a song. So can we just respond in worship today? Believing, believing that God can work through what you're walking through. Amen. Amen, church, let's sing. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.